Jerusalem is a very, very special city. We have eight or nine candidates for mayor. This has never happened before. You're listening to Inside Israel Today with Gil Hoffman on the Land of Israel Network. Hello and welcome to Inside Israel Today here on the Land of Israel Network on thelandofisrael.com. It's great to be back here in Jerusalem after a short trip abroad and uh, to work with the esteemed producer here of the Land of Israel Network. So we're glad to be here broadcasting, telling you what's going on behind the scenes here in Jerusalem. And we have going on right now a very exciting race for Mayor of Jerusalem. Nir Barkat, our current mayor, has decided to enter national politics He believes he's going to be our finance minister or some other senior minister, uh, that uh, his alliance with Netanyahu will help build himself up on a national level to perhaps succeed the prime minister whenever he goes. And so that has left a vacancy there at City Hall in uh, Safra Square in downtown Jerusalem, overlooking the old city walls. And the person who has been covering municipal politics in Jerusalem better and longer than anyone else is the talented writer for the Jerusalem Post, Peggy Sidor, uh, who has been covering it for, for 20 years now. Peggy, thank you for coming here on Inside Israel Today on the Land of Israel Network on thelandofisrael.com. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, now, for ladies and gentlemen, if you do the math... If Peggy's been covering municipal politics for 20 years here in Jerusalem, that means that that two of the three mayors that she's covered have gone to prison so far. Uh, Eud Olmert, Uri Lepolyansky went to prison near Barkat and has so far managed to stay out of the slammer. What does that tell us about Jerusalem politics, Peggy? Well, Jerusalem is a very, very special city. Whatever, you know, from any side you can look at it, it's a very special place. One of the first thing I would say I would notice is that um, this is the first time ever that there are uh, we have eight or nine uh, candidates for mayor for these uh, elections. This has never happened before. This is really, really something special. So we have eight or nine. Well, well the, nine, the ninth is, um, is sort of uh, getting out of the race. We're still with eight people, eight, eight candidates. And uh, this tells something about the importance of Jerusalem, I think. It sure, it sure does. And, and my producer told me that I was cynical. Ehud Olmert and uh, Lupoliansky were involved in, in uh, uh, similar scandals and everything. So you were it, not cynical. You were telling the truth. Absolutely. Sad. Uh, sad but true. Um, yeah. So uh, tell us about the leading candidates in this race. You, you've interviewed them all and even hosted debates between them. Well, we have, first of all, uh, the candidate that uh, is still here with us from the last elections, Moshe Leon, the guy who came from Give a Time, moved to Jerusalem uh, five, almost six years ago. He was convinced that he would it would be a piece of cake, and it wasn't, and he was not elected. Uh, interestingly enough, he remained here in Jerusalem, moved to Jerusalem, uh, left Give a Time, and has become a Jerusalemite, and he is, um, he's running again. Uh, his chances are not very high, but he's still in the race. He, the last polls gave him something like 11 up to 12 percent of chances, but that could change if he manages to obtain uh, the support of at least a part of the Haredim in Jerusalem, who um, are, let me remind you and the, and, and the listeners, they are 39% of the Jewish population of Jerusalem. We're talking about the uh, the ultra-Orthodox here the for our listeners abroad. Yes. Uh, her, her, so, the spokeswoman of Moshe Leon told me uh, she is absolutely sure that he will get the support of all of them. Well, that's her job to say. I yeah. would be a little bit more cautious. Uh, he might get, he might have a chance. It depends on what happens with the other can another candidate who is uh, Yossi Deitch. Yossi Deitch is, uh, is uh, presently uh, deputy mayor uh, representing the uh, Orthodox uh, list at the uh, city council. He wants to run for it. He has obtained two weeks ago um, the um, okay from his part of the, you know, the ultra Orthodox form uh, are formed by two parts, the Lithuanians, the Litvaks, and the Hasidim 
Okay, he belongs to the Hasidim. So the Hasidim supports him. They, they, they think he should run. The Lithuanians, who are the majority of the Orthodox, are not so happy about the whole idea. They are very much afraid that he, if he loses, the situation of the, uh, of the Orthodox in the city would not be so good, to put it mildly. So they are trying to keep him out of the race. For the moment, he keeps trying. He still has time. The uh, deadline for submitting candidacy is September 28th, so he still has about a month ago ahead of him. And uh, if finally Deitch does not run, probably a large part of the uh, ultra-orthodox will uh, find their way to support one or the other of candidates. One would be Leon, Moshe Leon. The other one should be, or could be, Zev Elkin. Zev Elkin is presently a minister, and he's member of the cabinet, and he's very, very close to Netanyahu. Actually, Netanyahu sends him for some delicate missions abroad every time and again, um, but he still wants to try his chances and become the mayor of Jerusalem. Um, I asked him a few times, why, why do you want to become a mayor of Jerusalem? You have a very high position and your future is, uh, you know, very clear. And he says that Jerusalem is so important that he is willing to leave behind him the position of a minister, member of the cabinet, and to come to Safra Square and uh, run the city. But he's also he said that he that he won't stay if he loses the way other can the way Absolutely. Moshe Leon yes. and Nir Barkat did before him became opposition leader and uh, deputy mayor. Uh, he says no. If I'm not the mayor, I'm going back, and he's very honest about that. Yes, he's very honest about that. He's very honest about a few things. By the way, he says all the time that he has a lot of plans to improve the situation in Jerusalem economically and and socially and politically and whatever. But he says also he might not succeed. He it's a very tough. Um, uh, issue. He's not sure he will uh, provide all the things. He will try his best. He's, he keeps telling, you know, that don't be sure that I will succeed. It's a very, very difficult um, task to, to run Jerusalem. It's a very difficult city, that's for sure. Now, he's and also in an interesting place because he's a member of Likud, but yes. the Likud does not support him. Can you explain why? Oh, yes, that's the most juicy part of it. <laughs> <laughs> because most of the, you know, the uh, Likud branch in Jerusalem is a very powerful one. And uh, traditionally, we say that Jerusalem is a right-wing city. You know, most of the, of the residents, of the Jewish residents, are on the right side of the political map. Um, the issue is, believe it or not, an issue of honor. Because at the Likud branch in Jerusalem, they were expecting Prime Minister Netanyahu to ask them to support he to support uh, Elkin and to run with him. He didn't for I don't know for for which reasons, but he didn't. So they were very they felt insulted and, and offended, and they decided not to support Elkin. So the branch the Likud branch in Jerusalem is divided into three um, candidates. They support three candidates. Uh, a part of them support Elkin, another part of them support Leon, and another part has not decided who they are going to support. Wow, and, and uh, Leon put a Likudnik as number two on his list. Yes. Uh, yes. Everybody wants to try to get the support of the Likudniks because they're not united. Exactly, and they are they are a majority in Jerusalem. We, we have to remember that. It's very important. I mean, like, if you want to have a, a, a massive support uh, being uh, friendly with the Likud branch is a good idea. Now, Elkin told me something interesting. Uh, he told me that the reason why he decided not to run with Likud is because they, before he announced his candidacy, had already chosen their candidates. Uh, ten men, no women at all. And uh, yesterday, ahead of an event uh, that the Likud had in their headquarters that they've had forever on Eliash Street in Jerusalem, they told me, don't worry, we are reserving the third slot for a woman. We haven't found her yet. We don't. We don't know. Uh, maybe they have, and they just won't tell me. Uh, but uh, there's a mystery woman out there who's going to be the only woman on the Likud list. Well, they haven't found her yet because there's actually a hunt after women for the political um, uh, elections for these things. All the lists and all the candidates, except for da for Daesh, for the ultra orthodox are looking for um, a woman that would be representative and that would include in their lists. 
it's a real, you know, it's a real, it's a real race. Cherchez la femme, you know, <laughs> you are looking for a woman. So, uh, uh, Yossi Chavilio, another candidate who was uh, in, during uh, Uri Lopolensky's times, he was the uh, legal advisor at the, at the municipality. And then he uh, didn't, you know, it did went right between him and Lopolensky. Then he started to work very good with, uh, with Barkat. And then a big black cat passed over there. I don't know what happened. Nobody knows what exactly happened, but uh, they don't talk to each other anymore. And Javido is today a candidate. His chances are very low. Um, most of the polls um, locate him at about between 4 and 5 percent. He might go uh, inside the, the, the council, the city council. That's, that he has a great chance to be there, but no, nothing more. He also is looking for a woman for the third place or the second place even. Um, what do we have also? We have the uh, Labour oh. Party. They don't. They they have, haven't still decided if they want to have to run a list of their own or, or join another one. It's not clear. Oh, well, they still have about amounts to decide. And we have the secular uh, candidate Ofer Berkovich, who in the Ofer polls Berkovich of is, Channel Two yeah. is doing quite yeah. well. He's doing very well. He is becoming a kind of how should I say it in good English? The default case, default because it's it's not that pe most of the people who vote for him or support him are doing that because he is the only choice and the only option to have a pluralist secular. Uh, candidate for for mayor, okay? They uh, and he's very popular. He's young, he's dedicated. He means well. He wants to do things. He wants to change things. He has very good uh, intentions, and he is uh, he he is in a very good place. I mean, he's now uh, one of the three most realistic candidates that will reach the uh, final line. Uh, Together him, with uh, Elkin and Deitch, might not run. And might who and Dutch who might not run. If, if Dutch doesn't run and and his constituency moves to Leon, Leon becomes the third uh, realistic candidate. Very interesting race as it goes on. Now we have a former, we have a current member of Knesset running, uh, Rachel Azaria, who no one's really paying much attention to. Uh, can a woman not be elected mayor in this city, or or is it for another reason? Well, that would be the first reason. And also because, well, Rachel Azaria is a modern Orthodox, uh, liberal. Uh, she's not on the left wing, but she's liberal. And uh, she has uh, conducted a few struggles against uh, Orthodox when she was at the uh, council. And they do not forget that. Actually, she's a real red flag in their eyes, in the eyes of the Orthodox. And frankly, I mean, whether whether you like it or not, you cannot really win a race in Jerusalem, a political race, if you are enemy number one of the ultra-Orthodox. It, it just doesn't work. They might decide that you're not important enough for them, but that's not the case with Rachel. And Rachel Azaria is really has become a red flag in their eyes. And um, they will do. They will do anything to stop her. She has, you know, since she decided and announced that she was uh, coming back to Jerusalem and running, she stands at about between six to seven, perhaps a little bit more per, uh, percent. Um, this puts her in the situation that she will probably end up again at the council. There are rumors. I, I, I insist there are only rumors for the moment that once inside the council, she will join Elkin and become his, one of his deputies. Uh, that could be. But, that could uh, be, but Elkin has already taken the former head of the same Yerushalmi party that uh, Rachel Azaria leads, uh, who in between her t two times leading that party, led the party. Uh, her name is Fleur Hassan Nahum. She's become yeah. the number two person, uh, at least she says so, and Elkin says so on Elkin's list, but a lot can change between now and that September, uh, you said 26 deadline? In 20, 28th of September is the, for the last submitting of running. And the, the, uh, the elections are on October 30. No, I'm telling you something. This is a little bit more complicated because Florence Hassan Nahum made a 
brilliant move and joined uh, Elkin, and she's number two. So she, so if he is elected, he will probably be one of the deputies. But Jerusalem has the right to have eight deputies mayor, which is much more than any other city in the country. So with eight deputy mayors, uh, you can do a lot of things. Okay, and um, and it, it could be. I mean, this scenario that Elkin is uh, is mayor and he has uh, Fleur as one deputy and Rochel Azara as a second deputy is not uh, unrealistic. It's absolutely possible. Okay, um, and uh, there's a couple. There's uh, Avi Solomon. Is he still in the race? Avi Solomon is still in the race. He is coping now or trying to cope now with a, a few. Uh, very unpleasant things. There is one of his uh, former uh, assistants and supporters who, this is, who declares that he has found out that he is uh, involved in uh, criminal act activities or criminal people. It's not clear for the moment. Um, Salman's reaction was that he was going to take him to court. And we're expecting, we're waiting to see what comes out and what develops from there. Well, but he is still in the race. That's enough candidates, I think. Uh, speaking of criminal, um, I, I just came back from the headquarters of the Shas party where a convicted felon, our Minister of Interior right now, uh, Arya Derry, uh, the leader of the party, uh, gave a press conference and launched his campaign of the, his party in which he predicted that his party would become the largest party in the city. Let's play a tape of the uh, jingle that there was at the Shah's headquarters. That was the jingle at the Shah's headquarters uh, where they were unveiling their new campaign. Peggy Sidor, is there any chance that Shah's, the Sephardi ultra-Orthodox party, could become the largest party in Jerusalem? No, I don't think so. I, I really don't think so. Actually, about a few, about less than six months ago, the the word was that they were going to disappear from the political map. And it's very interesting because Shas was born at, at Jerusalem City Council in uh, 1983. Uh, and just after that, from there, they uh, jumped to become a, par a national party at the Knesset. But they started their way in, in the, at the council, at Jerusalem Council. And they were a revolution at the moment. It was a kind of a revolution. But today, their situation is very different. Well, you know, I would like to say one thing. Generally speaking, inside the, the Haredi, the ultra-Orthodox society, whether it is Ashkenazi or Sephardi, Shas, or United uh, Torah Judaism, uh, the times, the era when uh, everybody would stand up and do what one of the rabbis, the Poskei Hado, would say is over. We're not there anymore. It's not, it's very different. And uh, Haredim, Orthodox, would vote for Likud or for uh, Anal, for Elkin, who's a, a you know, national religious. Um, that, this is something new. This has to be taken into account. It was not like that. Never. This is new. Absolutely. And, and I, I do have to say, that Derry did serve his time and then await the uh, amount of time you need afterward uh, to come back. Um, one thing that's interesting, though, is that f no one really among these candidates can replace Barkat in terms of being worldly and, and representing Jerusalem on an international stage. The only one of the candidates that you mentioned who speaks English fluently is Rachel Azaria, who probably will drop out before the end, uh, the deadline to announce their candidacy in, in, a, in an official way. So is, is Jerusalem going to be downgraded basically no matter who wins? Well, um, it, it's more, you know, that's, that's true what you say and regarding Barkad and regarding Rachel's capacity. But Elkin could be um, replacing Barakat at least in the circles of the uh, su great supporters of Israel abroad, uh, in you know, in part of the uh, Jewish communities, uh, not especially the liberal ones for sure, but uh, but the others, and in Europe and in and East Europe. He just came back yesterday from another mission in Ukraine. He is he uh, he goes to he, he, to to Russia many times. 
he's in contact with all these communities and so it, it depends what do you mean by representing Israel in those circles if it's in the, in the United States and in the liberal circles yes you're right not that Barkat was so liberal but you know he made his way there but uh, if you're enlarging the circles uh, Elkin could give you know yeah, could do something about that. Yeah. That's for sure. But yeah. the others won't. That's that's true. And, and his number two, Fleur, uh, she speaks. Oh, she certainly. She just came back. She just came back from a mission. She was sent by him to uh, Latin America, then, to Honduras, and uh, another country. Brazil. I don't remember exactly. N n native Spanish speaker. Uh, yes. Mother tongue English speaker yes. and French speaker. So she can yes. uh, work her way around. And, and all the lists have uh, made a point of having a, a, somebody French reflecting the new demographics in the city, the amount of French that have moved in. Uh, on uh, Elkin's list, the, there is a French speaker who is number four on the list. Uh, on Moshe Leon's list, he's made a point of having a French speaker. Uh, yeah. So, uh, um, the, uh, also, Danny Luz uh, from Montreal, who speaks French. Uh, and Ofer Berkovich's list, current city council member. And Ofer himself is married to a, a uh, French woman's yes uh so we've got that international kind of level and i guess my last question to you peggy uh, you've covered now near barcott for a decade you you are the expert on this man does he have what it takes if the right circumstances arise for him to be prime minister one day Ooh. <laughs> well i can tell you one thing he absolutely wants to reach that point he is working you know he's a he's a marathon runner and I asked him once, what does it mean in politics? It means, he said, it means that I will not rush after anything. I will take the time it takes. And if it takes years, it will take years. He's a young person. He's, uh, he's less than, he's 55 or 56 years old. He has a lot of time ahead of him. And, and he, he means that. He wants to reach that place. Does he have the capacity? Is he the man? Don't know. Uh, one of his um, one of the problems with Barkat is that he has been surrounded. He's very honest. He means well. He's a hard worker. Everything you know can say a lot of you know positive things. But there's one problem with him. He has surrounded himself all the time by people who have never argued or disagreed with him. I think it's a problem. Interesting, interesting. He certainly doesn't have what it takes to be finance minister then, where everybody disagrees with you. Yeah, well, I wouldn't see him as a finance minister, no. But perhaps perhaps foreign minister, foreign affairs. Trade minister? Well, Trade they... minister, yes, this kind of things, yes. So... He, he knows something about uh, high tech and business, that's for sure. Interesting. Well, Peggy, thank you for providing that wealth of information and experience that you have covering municipal politics uh, in Jerusalem the, the, the last several years with the Jerusalem Post, which I uh, hope the owners of the Jerusalem Post realize what a treasure they have in you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, listeners, thank you for being with us here on Inside Israel today as we have examined uh, what's going on behind the scenes in the very exciting race for Mayor of Jerusalem that will be taking place on the 30th of October. I'm sure there will be many twists and turns between now and then. So uh, stay tuned to www.jpost.com, of course. Download the app if you haven't already. It's free. And also here on the Land of Israel Network on thelandofisrael.com. Thank you and shalom from Jerusalem. Bye-bye. The question is, why are the Jews there in the first place? The Jewish people have been yearning to return to their ancient homeland for a long time. It's the Yishai Fleischer Show, the voice of a new generation of pro-Israel activists. And there's only two kinds of minorities in the Middle East, armed or unarmed. Inspiring minds to think differently. That jihadism doesn't just attack Jews. It attacks Christians, and it mostly attacks Muslims. Inspiration, spirituality, and politics. So first and foremost, this country is here to defend Jewish people and to live in its ancestral homeland. Listen to the Yishai Fleischer Show every week on the Land of Israel Network at thelandofisrael.com.